Welcome everybody to the SNN Network Summer Virtual Event. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and I'm very excited to bring to you our next uh, panel for this event. It's actually being hosted and moderated by the host of the Avoiding the Crowd podcast, the founder and, and lead editor of geoinvesting.com. In my opinion, one of the best microcap investors that's in the game today and in probably the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, I'm not trying to age him or anything, but you know, 10, 15, 20. But uh, uh, without further ado, we got Maj Sway Don. Maj, what's going on, man? I didn't know you were investing for that long. Wow, 15 Me, years. you! Oh, yeah. oh, you didn't know you. <laughs> you're, like, I, you you're saying you didn't know you, you were investing that long. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, well, thanks, man. Thanks for introducing me here. Um, of course, good, dude. To be, good to be here again. Yeah. Well, look, at the last event that we did, you know, that one we had investors coming on and doing uh, pitches of companies that either they're invested in or they find interest in. And we thought we kind of flipped the script a little bit and bring on companies that you have interest in and or are invested in. So, you know, before we say which companies there are, I mean, you can probably see the description. You'll, you'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly, you know, but what, what, why, why are these two companies um, ones that you thought about wanting to have on for this um, panel pitch session. Yeah, so a lot of times, well, we've done this before. I've had, you know, uh, we've done turnarounds here and there and maybe companies that were early in their, in their, in their growth um, kind of um, phase. But I wanted to actually bring two companies that I thought were at the really a very important inflection point of their growth. Um, so I thought it'd be pretty cool to bring these two companies on. Can, can I say who they are now? Or Yeah, please do. Uh, yeah, yeah, so Smart Employee Benefits, that's uh, S-N-E-Y-F. And SEB, uh, it's trading in the Canada also, uh, and Crescendo Communications CXDO. Those are the two companies. Um, I've been following the companies for a little bit of time. Shareholder. And I'm a shareholder. Yep. These are two very high conviction holdings of mine, um, and I thought that'd be a good idea too because I don't always bring the highest conviction stock, um, companies on these in interviews. I thought this would be a great time to do it because um, I think they're really hitting it on all four cylinders right now, and. Um, or it could be whatever, eight cylinders, whatever car you're driving. <laughs> I don't know, but six, I'm not a car six, guy. Six, <laughs> six cylinders. Yeah. You know, if you're gas conscious, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so I find quality cool. battery. <laughs> yeah. my, my last, my last cylinder. There's a Tesla coming on here. Don't worry about it. Not <laughs> um, it'd be a high quality, it would be a high conviction short that I'd be losing money on right now for years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's too fun. Yeah, but look, well, I thought it'd be kind of cool, man. And like, I know you said you wanted to keep these a 10 minute interview, but I couldn't do that. You knew that wasn't going to happen. No uh, chance. So about, I think they're about 20 minute interviews. And yep. so something too is uh, we're doing a, we do a lot of interviewing on geo vesting. And we bring a, uh, first thing I do in the process of geo is I'll interview these companies for uh, the CEO or CFO first. And if we think they're, um, it's a great story, we bring them on again to geo investing to do maybe a, the, um, the presentation or fireside chat on geo. Um, and it's probably right now, I think one of the most sought over things we do at geo, our members love it. We kind of bring, you know, bring in you know, these management teams into your, into your house and into your living room. Um, and it's really cool. And it's my favorite part of the whole process. I love talking to management teams. You know, I, I love them. I don't love writing so much. I like just, you know, talking to these teams and that's the part I like about, investing the most. Um, and I thought it'd be a great idea that to, they're both very um, CEO. Um, I'm sorry, both companies are very articulate in the way they present their stories and you can see the passion and then they both delivered. That's what I think is cool too. They both delivered so far uh, as uh, smart employee benefits is a turnaround story actually. And what's funny about that one is um, Tom Bernie, one of our members at geo and I think he's a member on um, MCC also I brought me, uh, the company about, I think, three years ago, and I want nothing to do with it. I mean, it has had a lot of debt, it had a capital structure I hate, everything I would hate about a company at that time in terms of, you know, optically. Um, but uh, he said, just watch it. And and I, now I've been watching it. He, he came back to me and say, you know, this is about maybe six months ago, I think, hey, have you seen what's going on with the company? And I, said, I took a look at it and, and I was like, wow, they really, they, they avoided a really bad situation. Um, and they've really just um, created this one-stop solution for uh, employee benefit solution platform for the companies. And it's, 
you know, I think 85% recurring revenue, predictable revenue backlog now between like a three and nine year backlog. Um, they spent the last several years investing in the company uh, to get to this point of, of, of inflection here. And, you know, they're still not making money yet, but they, you know, they put together a string of EBITDA positive quarters. Um, they've shed a lot of their lower margin revenue. And now they have higher margin revenue in the pipeline. And I think over time we'll see, you know, that EBITDA drop to, a, you know, turn into a net income. Um, the other one, Crescendo, is an area I love. Um, I'm, I'm in this cloud communication area, you know, that's, in, um, I love these come uh, this is the sector because about over 60% of small businesses haven't converted over to cloud yet. They're going to have to, you know, the pandemic has kind of accelerated that. And I own a bunch of companies in that space. And Crescendo is one of my favorites. Um, and, you know, again, this is a magic team that's delivered from the very second I started following the company three or four years ago. And um, I actually just took a position maybe two years ago into it. It took me a while to get in, involved in the company. Um, it's got a management team that's basically done it before in the same industry, in the telecom industry. Um, they, were, they were together in previous endeavors. They're, they're doing it again. They, they, had that, they, they founded that company, sold it for a big premium. They're doing it again. I think they're going to do it again over here in Crescendo. Um, and you, know, you have this nano cap company but with a really A suite, like a, a top tier management team. It's pretty awesome. And they just recently made an acquisition, which the uh, I don't think the market's respecting. That makes them a top four player in this like Ring Central Zoom type of industry. When you look at the valuation discrepancy between Crescendo, I think it may be about four, maybe four or five ish in uh, you know EV to sales uh, compared to fifteen to twenty in these other two, uh, other players. So there's a lot of uh, interesting um, opportunity that I think to fill that gap for the company. But it's going to take time. You know, they just recently up- uplifted the Nasdaq, so. You know, I don't think they're really known that well by the market yet, but I think they will be in you know, a few more quarters. Well, Maj, without further ado, who's first up? First, we have Smart Employee Benefits. The CEO and CFO will both be present for that um, chat. Hello, everybody. This is Maj Swaydan from uh, Geo Investing. I'm here with uh, John McKim and Mohammed Al Shaya. Um, uh, John is a CEO, and Mohammed is COO of Smart Employee Benefits. Uh, trades under the symbol SEB.V in Canada and SMEYF on the uh, OTC here uh, in the U.S. So I'm glad to have you, uh, both you on here today, and we're here to talk about their company. I, I own this company. Um, I've owned it for a few months now, and I'm really excited about their growth story, and I wanted to share their story with all of you. So um, what's, um, thank you guys for being here today. Now we're going to try and keep this short, about 15, you know, 15, 20 minutes, get through some of the key points uh, of, um, of what you do. I have some questions from my network also. Maybe we can get into them later on or as we go through this. So let's get right to it. So John, um, tell us what you do. Uh, We're a provider of fully integrated and modular uh, IT benefits administration and software solutions and services. All of our technology solutions and services design, implement, and manage digital transformation roadmaps for our clients. So, and so you're basically, you're, you're, and you're mainly helping companies automate their benefit process type of solutions. Is that, if, if that would, would that be a good way of summing it up? Yes, we we uh, we digitize back office environments uh, with a big focus on the group benefits and the life insurance space. Uh, it's a huge marketplace, and uh, and the digitization basically we have our own software, proprietary software plus software of and solutions of third parties that we integrate into a uh, a common third party administrator platform, and we implement the, that platform with our clients. Um, to uh, essentially fully automate uh, the whole management of uh, of their benefit and life solutions for their employees. All right. So, if you give give me an example of how inefficient maybe um, the solu- uh, the um, the industry is before you came along or before your solutions. How would a typical company um, go through the whole benefits process, and how are you solving some of those problems that they were facing before you came along? Okay, Mohammed, you want to address that? Yeah, I can pick on that. Thanks, Maj, for having us. It's always a pleasure to catch up with you. Um, 
the 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 market um, hasn't been consolidated um, for quite um, very long time, but also there was a very little disruption in this industry when it comes to the um, use of technology um, and the automation of some of the um, business processes. So we saw an opportunity where we could um, give better insights, better analytics, um, give more information for plan sponsors at the time when they want to renew um, their benefits plan, or even when they consider a new benefits program for their employees. Um, giving that control back to the plan sponsor to be able um, to make um, the right decisions and strategic decisions around um, their group benefits was unique um, um, from a feature and the capability perspective. So we looked at the whole landscape from the technology stack to the application, the workflow, the business processes, and finally the end user experience. Integrating all of those um, under our proprietary application or platform, we've developed an ecosystem where it's fully integrated between um, with the um, payroll systems, HR systems, the underwriters and the carriers, other third-party providers, and all aggregated in one billing platform and administration platform, providing that member the opportunity to easily navigate through their benefits plan, elect their benefits, um, and definitely end up uh, choosing uh, the benefits that are more relevant for their um, lifestyle. Excellent. And so basically you have this, this back office solution, but you're also basically have a one-stop solution for uh, employees to be able to kind of uh, choose what they want. Now, is the employee actually interacting with this also and, and making choices or is the employer kind of doing it for them after interacting with the employee? That's, that's a fantastic question. I can pick on that as well. So there are three delivery models for our um, service. One is a SaaS, a software as a service. The other one is a co-managed. And the third delivery model is a, a, an outsourced, a fully outsourced model. Um, there are um, various um, channels and interaction points, one at the plan member level, and that's where the plan member goes and um, navigates um, the technology to select their benefits and to um, identify the options that they want to go through. And those plan designs can vary from a traditional plan design into a much more flex uh, plan design and anywhere in between. Um, there is also the plan sponsor um, portal where the plan sponsor can have visibility um, and access to generate reports um, to, um, to support their members in a co-source model, but also have full um, control over the benefits um, uh, plan and experience that their members um, are, are, are getting. Um, the third one is um, really the back office. And this is where um, in a full outsource, we white label um, the complete platform to look, feel as the plan sponsor, um, starting with our contact center all the way into our um, uh, back office operations where um, we deliver the service on behalf of the plan sponsor. We do the administration of the plan design. We provision the member portal. Um, we do the support. We answer the calls. Um, we do the day-to-day -day operations for our customers. That's, that's awesome. I think you've really summed it up really well here for us in terms of what you do. But this didn't this wasn't an overnight success for you guys. Um, it, there was a lot of hard work here. So a key to what you, to, to making your platform you know beneficial and work is having enough products and solutions, I guess, to have this like one stop shop. So tell us a little bit about how you built that platform over time and some of the struggles that you had to go through too and the early challenges. I think that's an important part of the story. I'll give you some feedback there, uh, uh, Maj. Uh, we've been, uh, we started the company in January 2011, so we're 10 years now. Uh, it, uh, it takes a long time to build things of, of value, as we found out. Uh, we made a number of acquisitions along the way, and the acquisitions uh, targeted various things. They helped us uh, acquire client base, and they helped us build out our technology roadmap. 
So we had a vision of what we wanted at the end of the day and what we wanted to provide our clients. So um, now you can build that totally uh, from scratch, uh, which is always the most difficult way. Or you can buy organizations that are already in the marketplace. You can take uh, the clients and the technology and the feedback from the clients. You can integrate the technology uh, that you've acquired and you can evolve that into a single platform. So that's essentially what we've done. So in the space of 10 years, we've taken um, uh, 12 acquisitions. We, we made 14 acquisitions. We, got, uh, we sold back two of them uh, that turned out not to be core, but we ended up now with uh, over 500,000 plan members uh, under contract, over 330,000 on our platform, over 400 million of, of signed contracts that include backlog, evergreen type contracts uh, and option year type contracts uh, that go out some as long as nine years. Uh, we have uh, name brand clients. Uh, you know, if you look at, at uh, the largest corporations in Canada or the most notable corporations in Canada um, and uh, probably one out of every two uh, are our clients. And so now uh, that helps us uh, develop our technology roadmap because these clients spend millions of dollars on consulting advice in terms of how they manage their environments for their employees. And we have the benefit of that uh, thought leadership uh, in the development of our technology roadmap um, because we're the ones that have to deliver and, and execute against their vision. So that's how we've got to this stage. So we have uh, probably 35% of uh, the largest clients in Canada uh, or the most notable clients in Canada on our platform. And we are now evolving into the emerging marketplace, which is sort of the employees under 500, that, uh, under 500 employees. So we've taken the technology uh, that we have developed and, and uh, integrated into some of the most um, sophisticated clients in the country. And we've evolved that platform into a, a digital marketplace that now is approaching the emerging market. So where the emerging clients can have the same capability and the same functionality that the large clients have, uh, but in a cost-effective manner. So that's what has taken us 10 years to get here. We currently manage, uh, we have under contract about 1.3 billion of premiums. And, um, and we've launched a, a very unique business model for that emerging marketplace where we, what, we don't go after the individual clients. We go after the organizations as the channel partners who already have those clients. And we deploy our uh, third-party administration environment and our technology environment uh, as a white label uh, for these organizations. So no different than one of our large corporate clients. We basically deploy that with brokers and consultants and uh, that already have uh, those clients and uh, everything is in the cloud. Uh, and uh, we managed, uh, uh, as Mohammed says, we can deploy our technology on three different platforms, uh, SaaS, uh, co-source, or um, uh, fully outsourced. Uh, the majority of our clients like the fully outsourced model um, because it's, it's the easiest for them. They don't have to worry about technology. And also, uh, uh, what you're on our platform is very difficult to move after that, given all the functionality and things that we have. Uh, that you really can't find in the other platforms. Mohammed, do you wish to add to that? Yeah, no, you've covered it, uh, John. Um, one thing to add is that um, part of our vision is creating this exceptional experience for our clients and members every day. And to do so, um, we wanted to, do a uh, to implement a technology-driven business model where we could um, evolve our technology over time um, and to answer your point, Maj, around what are those initial modules that we've built around them, our product roadmap is really our member side and our back office admin. Those are the two modules that needs to go first into the 
um, client environment configured. And then you can unlock a lot of those opportunities where you could cross-sell, upsell, and introduce more value add so into the, into the client and the opportunity. There are also some other standalone modules that can be offered, even if we are not doing the complete benefits administration, that we can offer them on a SaaS base or even a co-source or a, uh, fully outsourced models. Um, uh, but the core um, entry into our client base is really with our member site and the back office admin and billing platforms. Beautiful, thank you. So that was something um, I remember uh, from talking in the past uh, conversations. I think you had talked about, hold on a second. I think you had talked about um, uh, the revenue per plan, uh, plan member. Was that a number that you were talking about? Well, where that is right now and where that might be going? Uh, if you take a, um, an average benefit plan, uh, let's say around $3,000, now, some of them go up to five, six, seven, eight, and, and some are as low as like 2,000, 2,500. If you just take the average benefit plan of about $3,000, uh, the administration revenue and, uh, you, know, the, you know, the managing the back office environment is a minimum of about $250 a plan member per year. Okay. At the moment, uh, you know, our, our solutions will capture over 90% of, the, uh, of that, that those activities that comprise that 250 plus. Today, uh, we do about $45 per plan member per annum. Uh, our target uh, over the next uh, 24 months or so is to move that to $100. Now, as I say, the, uh, our uh, technology solutions can capture the pretty much all of the 250, but it just takes clients time to make the decision to adopt all the modules and so forth. And we have to have a certain amount of sales there. But if you look at the 500,000 plan members that we have uh, uh, on our platform, the 500,000 plus plan members, um, then there's a lot of organic revenue opportunity just within our existing client base. Um, and um, so that's a big part of our, our focus. So we're not only focused on new clients, uh, and white label TPA opportunities, uh, but our existing client base uh, can substantially increase our revenue um, just by uh, uh, introducing new high value added modules uh, to those clients. Uh, we have one client, uh, well, we have a number of clients where we've done that, but one client in particular in 2017 was about uh, $800,000 of revenue for us. Um, over the last, since 2017, uh, we've been successful in increasing that revenue to over $5 million a year. So um, uh, if you look at that, uh, we have other clients that we've also increased the revenue substantially, and uh, that's just time. So, uh, uh, but uh, the opportunities, uh, the organic growth opportunities just within our existing client base are huge, as well as the new client opportunities. Excellent. So you have some nice Wall Street opportunities. You have a, a backlog, maybe of a three to nine year kind of horizon. Um, I mean, I think you have about 85% recurring revenue. Is that right? Or is that number correct? I'm sorry? Your recurring revenue. How much your revenue is recurring? Uh, uh, our recurring revenue, we have two different revenue streams. And uh, between them, uh, if you look out four years, if you look at our, our uh 20, 2021 target at revenue of about 70 million. And if you look out four years, uh, over, uh, over 80% of the 2021 revenue is already booked for the next four years. Now we do have contracts out as long as nine years. <clears throat> and, uh, but if you also look at that, uh, we have in the first six months of this year, we've added over 68 million of new contract value. So we're increasing, our contract value continues to grow uh, very quickly because our, our, our uh, uh, request for proposal wins, our, our uh, client bids are going up. We're up over 70% for the first half of this year on, uh, on new bids. And then our white label uh, TPA uh, business model 
has over uh, has over six billion of premium in it, in terms of uh, channel partners that we're in negotiations with. So that is a um, that's not uh, bid contracts. That's really uh, another level of sales. So uh, our pipeline is the largest it's ever been. Our recurring revenue in the next four years is very strong. <coughs> and we have contracts going out as long as nine years now. Excellent. So I'm going to end it with three more kind of questions here. And I'll just lay them out right now so you can think about them um, while, while, while you're answering here. Uh, number one, I'm going to want to talk about your goals to uh, maybe uplist to a, a better, a higher exchange. You're on the OTC now. Um, uh, number two, we want to get just maybe a summarization of your you know, financials a little bit um, and some of those highlights you can give us. And um, number three, maybe you address your capital structure and, and need to raise money. So those are the three things. Okay, the first question was the listing. We're currently listed on the TSXV, the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture. Uh, we meet all the criteria now for listing on the TSX proper. Uh, so that is on our timeline over the next year. Uh, we're also now, uh, we're in the OTC market in the UX, but we're uplifting that to the OTC QX. Um, you know, that'll give us uh, be blue sky and so forth. So that will allow some online trading and things like that. Uh, we expect that to be uh, uh, completed sometime in September. We have two brokers, one out of California, one out of New York that's supporting us on that. Um, so uh, there is, that's our, our listing. Um, and so most of that will be done, as I say, by the end of September. And now your second question, Maj, again. Let's go, let's go to capital structure. Talk about what's changed in your capital structure over the years. I mean, you had to blow it out a little bit to make some of your acquisitions. So where are you now with that? And maybe talk about the ability to grow organically versus having to like raise money. Okay. Uh, our capital structure, uh, we have uh, a $20 million convertible that is a strategic investment last year by a large Canadian insurance company where we're very strategic to them. Uh, and we have an operating line. That's the debt side of 10 million, which we use four or five uh, at any point in time. Uh, that's a receivables driven line. In terms of the equity side, uh, we have approximately 174 million shares outstanding. Uh, including the RSUs, which haven't invested, have invested yet, and uh, they're issued to uh, retention plans for employees and so forth. Um, so our intent is to do a consolidation, a one for five. So that'll take that back to about 35 million shares, 34, 35 million shares. And, um, and uh, at 30 cents, that'll take our stock price to about $1.50. Um, at that point, we start to get a lot more institutional investor interest because a lot of the small cap funds like to look at, in Canada, like to look at small cap stocks that are trading over a dollar and so forth. So uh, uh, we think that will, uh, that will help as well. Um, the, uh, the 20 million convertible takes a lot of our, took a lot of our short-term debt and turned it into a five-year note. Um, so uh, that really reduced the, the balance sheet risk that we had and, uh, and so forth. The organic growth opportunities that we spoke about, uh, you know, uh, we can grow that on our own working capital. We've now had five quarters of positive EBITDA. Uh, our CapEx programs are well under control now. Uh, if you go back three years, we were spending five, six million a year uh, in CapEx and we were expensing the majority of that. Today, uh, our CapEx programs are about 200,000 a year. And a lot of our technology roadmap uh, growth is really being paid for by our clients and involved in, in the uh, enhancement of opportunities for our clients. So we, we, that's well under control. Uh, we expect a good third quarter as well. So that'll be six quarters uh, going forward. Um, and um, if we raise money, uh, we would look at, uh, at uh, potentially raising equity, but we wouldn't do that before uh, a consolidation and, uh, and before the announcement of some of the transactions. We think we have some, um, you know, we, we have some good things on the table. And, and if we can win some of those, um, that should be very positive for us as well. So, um, so maybe, maybe later in the fall, we, we may raise some equity, but uh, we won't raise it at, uh, at our current prices. It'll, uh, and if we do uh, raise equity, 
uh, our intent would be to, uh, uh, it'll be a broker-driven uh, environment that would uh, that we think can uh, bring in a number of the small cap funds that, uh, uh, you know, they like to, to, to buy positions before they start buying anything in the marketplace. So, uh, so that's on our, on our horizon over the next five or six months. But uh, so that seems, we, we don't particularly need to raise cash to grow. Uh, we do have some acquisition targets we're looking at, uh, but we'll need a, uh, you know, we won't do those without a, a, a better stock price. So those are the things we're looking at. And we think with a good third quarter and, and some of the uh, deals we have on the table that uh, we're optimistic. Great. Excellent. And um, so uh, one last thing on the financials, and we got to close it here. Um, operating leverage. You, you, you've reached a point now where you've, you've spent a lot of, put a lot of money, investment into the company over the years. I'm assuming you're at a point now where as you grow revenue, you're going to have some type of operating leverage here where a lot of that revenue is going to drop to the bottom line. Well, if you go back and, uh, and look at our, uh, our numbers, uh, our gross margins, we really drive our business off our, off our gross margins. And uh, if you go back in 2016, 17, our gross margins were uh, in the 15, 16% range. Uh, if you look in 2020, uh, they were 32%. So our gross margins continue to grow. And if you look in the first half of, uh, of 20, uh, uh, 2021, the first two quarters, our gross margins were uh, almost 37%. So, uh, and, and a big part of that is because we're getting a lot more traction on one of our, on our benefit processing revenue streams. And so today, whether it's our uh, uh, more technology driven revenue streams or our benefit processing revenue streams, and they do operate uh, as brother and sister uh, with regard to our clients, uh, today, over 80% of every new gross margin dollar, no matter which revenue stream it comes from, goes to our uh, EBITDA and positive cash flow. So uh, lots of operating leverage in our, um, in our uh, uh, client base and in our current revenue streams. And if we are able to uh, grow our $45 to 100 um, you know, the majority of that, um, more than half of that will go to our bottom line. That growth. Excellent. Well, thanks, John and Muhammad. That was an awesome summary of uh, what, what your company does and your opportunities, some of your risks. And um, really appreciate the time you took today to be here with us. And we'll look forward to having an update with you in the future. Marsh, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time and really appreciate your interest in, in our company. Thank you. And where can people go find more information about you? Your company? www.seb-inc.com. All right. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Maj. Yeah. Thanks, Maj. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Maj, uh, for, for your conversation right there with Smart Employee Benefits. And who's up next? Next is uh, Crescendo Communications, ticker symbol CXDO. And we'll be talking to the CEO of that company. And this is Maj Swedan from Geo Investing. Um, I'm here with Doug Gaylor, uh, COO and president of Crescendo Communications. Symbol CXDO trades in the NASDAQ um, with, their, with its recent uplisting not too long ago. Um, CXDO um, uh, plays in the cloud communication, a UCAS kind of area. Um, and that's a, a particular area I'm really interested in investing in. And it's one of my higher conviction holdings in that space. And I'm really excited to hear um, Doug's story today and get an update on how things are going. And I kind of want to share that with um, a wider audience outside geo investing. Um, so, and that, I'll introduce Doug. Thanks for being here, Doug. Let's, let's talk about Crescendo. Thanks, Maj. Great uh, to be here and always excited to uh, have our discussions and, and tell you about uh, the great progress that we're making here at Crescendo. So as you already highlighted, uh, Crescendo is a unified communication as a service player. So we're a cloud communications company doing uh, business telephone services for small and mid-size and enterprise level businesses uh, competing against the likes of the Ring Centrals and the Vonages and the 8x8s and the uh, direct uh, marketplace. 
And then we're extremely excited that uh, last quarter we announced and finalized our acquisition of NetSapiens, who is a platform provider of UCAS services. They're the fourth largest platform provider in the United States behind Cisco's Broadsoft, Microsoft's Metaswitch, and Mitel's uh, platforms. And so, you know, we're really excited about where that positions us in the industry. And and uh, we had uh, a really strong earnings call uh, just yesterday. I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, where the company is going from here. That's awesome. Now, let's, let's get right to NetSapiens real quick here because... You know that kind of transformed the company. So NetSapiens has given you a much wider kind of product offering, right? So let's talk about what Crescendo was before NetSapiens and what it is after now to give us perspective. Yeah, perfect uh, and and great question. And so if you think about what Crescendo was before NetSapiens acquisition, we were selling our UCAS offering directly to end user businesses through a direct channel and through a partner agent channel. And basically what that means is that we were going out and selling our business telephone services to all size businesses, selling it uh, through our direct channel, which is about 25, 30% of our sales uh, volume. And then through our agent uh, um, partner program, which is about 75% of the uh, of the revenues that the company was getting prior to the acquisition. So with the acquisition of NetSapiens, the, the great part about this acquisition is that it really fills out the portfolio where we were just selling a platform before directly to end users. Uh, with NetSapiens, we've actually bought a platform that sells to other UCAS service providers. NetSapiens currently services over 1.7 million end users, and we anticipate that number being over 2 million here in the relatively near future. And so when we think about that uh, that captured audience, they've got uh, their partner base is UCAS providers selling uh, the UCAS platform from NetSapiens uh, to their end users. So the merger is extremely exciting for us because it really rounds out our portfolio. Now we can sell direct to end users through our direct and our agent program, and we can sell to platform providers uh, with a UCAS solution through NetSapiens. So we really have all of the options covered now and really have a tremendous opportunity to, to grow this to the next level. And that's good for your margins too, right? Because I think I think prior to the NetSapiens acquisition, some of your solutions were more third party, if I recall correctly, not necessarily all organically developed. Is that right? Yeah. So for example, uh, our collaboration tool. So we've got a collaboration tool very similar to Zoom. We're using uh, your Zoom uh, connection right now, but uh, we've got a, a platform, collaboration platform uh, with the NetSapiens acquisition that's very, very comparable to Zoom. Uh, in my opinion, biased opinion, obviously a better solution than Zoom out there. Uh, but prior to that uh, acquisition of NetSapiens, uh, we were white labeling a a collaboration tool. We were white labeling a mobility tool. And now with uh, the NetSapiens acquisition, we bring a lot of those uh, extra resources on the UCAS platform in-house that were developed and designed by the NetSapiens team. Great. Before I get into the numbers, what this does for you num number-wise, um, well, what is what do you do for NetSapiens? What was your advantage you brought to the table for them? What did they see in you? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So if you look at the combination of the two, uh, both companies were growing, uh, you know, extremely rapidly. Crescendo had 20% uh, growth uh, quarter over quarter in Q1 and Q2 in our traditional UCAS. Uh, NetSapiens in their uh, 2020 year uh, had a 30% increase over 2019. So they were rapidly growing in their UCAS offering. We were rapidly growing in our UCAS offering. Uh, but, you know, this is a very competitive marketplace. And so, you know, two companies coming together to have, uh, you know, more power, more leverage out there in the industry. Uh, so we bring to them, uh, you know, just a bigger organization, very sales marketing ori or oriented organization. Uh, and Sapiens was very focused on an engineering platform and, and have built a great platform. But they really needed the extra horsepower to uh, get them to the next level from a sales and marketing perspective and being able to grow the revenue and being able to uh, make it a much more profitable business. So when you look at the combination, you know, it's a perfect combination for us because it's an accretive acquisition. It's going to uh, add immediate uh, monthly recurring and, and uh, one-time revenue streams for us. And it's going to give us a very long-term uh, sticky customer because the partners that are using the Sapiens platform today that's their whole business model. Their whole business model is built on the NetSapiens platform. So it's a very, very sticky customer partner relationship. Excellent. So, so I want to get into margins in a second, but before we do that, why don't you talk about the size of NetSapiens compared to your size and your revenue? Let's break down maybe some of this information in the Q1 
I'm sorry, the Q2 release you just put out yesterday in terms of were you finding, were we seeing growth organically from in both companies? Yep, great. So uh, so we just announced our earnings uh, this week. And so uh, we had a 43% increase in revenue year over year for Q2 uh, at $5.8 million for the quarter compared to $4.1 million in the Q2 of, uh, of last year. And we had a 20% increase in our UCAS revenue for the quarter. So a very strong quarter for us. And that quarter only included one month of NetSapiens revenue. So NetSapiens uh, um, was finalized on June 1st. So we only had a 30 day uh, contribution of NetSapiens. So we anticipate that uh, with Q3, um, you know, that'll be a full quarter of NetSapiens revenue. So that'll be a really, really strong shot in the arm for us uh, from a growth perspective and from a revenue uh, uh, perspective. Again, when we look at uh, you know the organization, you know even putting the two organizations together on a non-gap basis, uh, you know we we had a slight non-gap uh, profit for the quarter uh, for Q2. You know obviously a lot of uh, acquisition costs and amortization costs that were built into Q2 that led to a gap loss. But uh, you know when we look at where we are financially, um, you know we're extremely extremely strong with uh, with this acquisition, and it's going to be a very accretive, very positive uh, revenue and bottom line growth uh, going forward. It's funny when you look at, I can't believe we're talking about profitability in the space. When you look about at other companies in the space and how they've evolved and uh, like compared to your, your size where you're at now, you're doing like six million a quarter right now. You know, most of those companies and even the larger companies are losing money on a gap and non-gap basis. So it's pretty cool that you're making money at, the, at these levels. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when you look at the competition out there in this uh, segment, you know, obviously much larger organizations like the Ring Centrals, the Vonages, the 8x8s, but, uh, you know, they've been racked with uh, tremendous losses. You know, we were extremely proud of the fact that, uh, you know, we had uh, gap uh, earnings uh, both in 19 and 20. And so, you know, very strong years for us. And so even with this acquisition, even with the pandemic headwinds, you know, we're still doing extremely well with 43% uh, revenue growth and you know, non-GAAP uh, positive, uh, positive income out there. So when we try to look at the story, I'm trying to figure out I mean, what are investors missing? So I mean, if you look at your, I think EV to sales right now on, um, on Ford numbers, um, you're um, at about just under four. And then when you look at some of the competitors like a Ring Central um, uh, or a Zoom, you know, they're north of 15, I think Zoom's in the 20s. You got Twilio, which is in the same space, but it's, you know, it's a more CPAS. But, you know, they're up there in that 20 area. Um, so I'm trying to think, what are, what are investors missing? Obviously, you're a nano cap company. You're kind of new on the scene to a lot of investors just coming to NASDAQ. But one thing I want, was interesting was some investors might look at the acquisition at Sapiens. And when you look at the pro forma numbers, you see, okay, well, before Net Sapiens, Crescendo was, I mean, I'm going to say you were over 80% recurring revenue. I don't, I don't know what that number Correct. was. Correct, yep, 85%. Uh, and, um, you know, Net Sapiens was probably 50-ish. Correct. Yeah. Think, right. So people think, okay, well, um, and then your margins are probably a little better gross margins because of your recurring revenue, like crescendos probably. Um, but why don't you tell people now, what, what, you know, tell us, well, really, if we look under the hood, why are we excited about net sapiens um, and how, how they can get an increase in their gross margins and changes in their business model have been going on to actually um, give us some optimism about how that those numbers are going to actually get better and more kind of maybe gravitate towards where you guys are at. Right. No, I think it's a great point is that, uh, you know, we, we kind of are that unsung hero out there in the in the industry. And so not many people know about us. It, the, these type of interviews are great uh, because it gets our story out there, gets our message out there to uh, to the to the crowd out there that is looking for the next best thing. So, you know, if you look back at uh, Ring Central, I remember when Ring Central was trading at, uh, you know, four or five dollars a share. And now it's at, uh, you know, it got as high as four hundred dollars a share. I think it's at the two fifty range now. You know, huge valuations, but uh, they've got huge valuations because they're the darling. They've had uh, you know tremendous revenue growth out there, and and they're taking advantage of an industry that's still got a, an extreme amount of opportunity. And so, if you're looking for the next uh, Ring Central out there, I mean, you know, I kind of feel like we're in that position. I mean, we're growing, we're growing rapidly. You know, 43 percent uh, increase uh, year over year. You know, that, that exceeded Ring Central's uh, Q2 announcement. I think they were at 35 percent. So we're growing uh, faster than uh, Ring Central now. Uh, we've got uh, non-gap earnings. Uh, you know, gap uh, profitability at the end of last year, which Ring Central doesn't have. So I think the biggest challenge we have is that you know we're not that known entity out there. 
we were on the OTC until uh, uh, July of last year. We uplisted organically, uplisted from the OTC to the uh, NASDAQ. You know, not many businesses do that, uh, but we were able to do that by just managing the business well and getting the gap profitability and increasing our shareholder equity. And so I think we're really in a, in a strong position. We manage the business extremely well. I think from a go forward perspective, if you look at uh, where we're trading at now, you know, our market cap is, uh, you know, similar in, to what it was, uh, you know, pre-acquisition. So, you know, when you think about the revenue stream that we're going to be adding from uh, NetSapiens on the pro forma basis for 2020, you know, it was $11.5 million. And we anticipate that, uh, you know, with growth, uh, you know, that number will be, you know, well north of what uh, we're averaging just with the one month that we added in June. So I think we're in a really right position to continue to grow the revenue from a gross margin perspective. Obviously, combining the two organizations, there'll be a lot of cost synergies there. Uh, you know, so they were, uh, you know, it's an accretive acquisition. And so when we think about cash flow, they were positive cash flow prior to the acquisition with our management strategy, our cost management and our, our guidance. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a very, very accretive acquisition going forward. So I think when I look at the opportunity for growth here, you know, it's pretty tremendous. And what it also gives us, uh, Maj, is a great opportunity for future acquisitions. So when I think about, you know, you and I have been talking about, uh, you know, Crescendo for at least three, four years now. And, you know, one of the things that you and I have talked about in many of our discussions over the years was acquisitions. And until we were able to do our capital raise, we did an S1 offering last year in August uh, or September. When we did that uh, raise, that allowed us to have the capital go out and make the NetSapiens acquisition happen. And so this has really put us in a nice position for future acquisitions. And with NetSapiens, we've got a customer base of 190 UCAS resellers out there already using our platform. That's, a, that's what I like to refer to as a stocked fishing pond. So if we think about where our next acquisition strategy is going to be, it's probably going to be in our stocked fishing pond to be able to increase that uh, top line revenue with accretive acquisitions that are already on our platform. And those will have amazing cost synergies going forward. Right now, the focus is really migrating or integrating the, uh, the NetSapiens acquisition. But once we do that, uh, you know, sky is the limit from an acquisition perspective of rolling up uh, opportunities within our own customer base. Beautiful. And, um, and I think that you, you talked about, um, this is interesting, how, how many, what percent of a small businesses have not adopted UK, uh, a, a, a cloud communication kind of platform yet? Yeah, the Frost and Sullivan report, and they're one of the, the leading experts, uh, industry analysts and consultants in the industry. And so uh, they released a report uh, just in the last three months. And, and their reports show that 61% of the businesses in the United States still have not moved over to the cloud for their communication services, which means that only 39% have adopted cloud communications. That's great, but that still means that there's a tremendous window of opportunity for future growth. And it's not a matter of if those other 61% move to the cloud it's when. So it's only a matter of time. The pandemic has really um, increased that uh, movement to the cloud, and it'll only continue to increase as businesses get back to their normal day-to-day uh, -day post pandemic. I think before the pandemic, that was around 75%, right? Correct. So, I mean, I think if you look at the pandemic, the pandemic is really, uh, you know, it was already growing fairly rapidly. I think the CAGR on, on the industry was about, uh, you know, nine or 10%, I think with the uh, Per, per year. And I think when you look at the uh, pandemic, that's increased it to you know, almost a 20% CAGR. So when you look at what's going on in the industry right now, you know, businesses, again, it's not a matter of if they move to the cloud, it's when, because the difference between premise and, and, and UCAS that we offer today is that the old premise systems don't allow you to have work from anywhere. The, the premise-based systems don't allow you to have, you know, a collaboration tool that's built into your, to your solution. So, you know, those, those old Avaya customers, the old Mitel customers, the old uh, uh, NEC customers that are using traditional premise-based systems, you know, they're really hampered with not having the efficiencies and productivity that UCAS brings to them. So again, it's, uh, I, I like to use the analogy of the, of the smartphone, uh, you know, everybody's got a smartphone now, but, you know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, everybody had a Motorola flip phone and that was the greatest thing since sliced bread until you realize that the smartphone did a million things better. And that's where UCAS is. UCAS is, uh, is really a much better technology for all these businesses. And so in a matter of time, you'll see all these customers migrating over. In fact, Gartner shows that, uh, you know, in, by 2024, you know, that percentage will be from 61% down into the teens. So a lot of runway for future growth. But, you, but it's, but it's, it's highly competitive. You got to get there. 
kind of fast though, right? Because exactly. I mean, it's, uh, I like to use the analogy of it's the wild west out there. So, you know, I'm, tr I'm going after the same customers that ring central Vonage eight by eight and the others are. So I gotta, I gotta have a better mousetrap. I gotta get there quicker. So I want to, um, two more things I want to circle back to, um, and the savings real quick. So the point I was making earlier about, uh, you know, net sapiens having about 50% of their revenue recurring and the gross margin lower than yours, that's because um, they have these more, they, um, they've been gradually, I think, going to more of a SaaS kind of pro, uh, platform, right? And that's Correct. like, can you use the margins to get better as we go through here, right? Correct. So uh, so just recently, did they start offering a, a SaaS type offering? So that's software as a service or, or infrastructure as a service, as we like to uh, refer to it. Uh, prior to that, uh, they were selling their, their platform where it was a one-time upfront fee and then a monthly recurring fee for the support and, and usage. And so it was a 50-50 split, but that 50-50 uh, split of one-time revenue versus recurring revenue is migrating heavily towards the recurring revenue model. And again, that's another one of the benefits of us coming to the table and, and blending with them is, is being able to backstop, uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, not having that need for the immediate upfront cash uh, outlay so before, as a smaller organization, you know, they would have to sell the platform with an upfront fee just to keep the business uh, running. You know, now with the software as a service, you know, it's a lot better model to have a much higher monthly recurring and not have as much of an upfront uh, non-recurring fee. Yeah, and that's that little extra accretion you're going to get from this, this combination as we move through um, the quarters here and possibly some upside surprise from as they accelerate that, I'm thinking. Exactly. So, I, I mean, I think that that's, you know, that that's the that's the way more and more businesses want to go is uh, less capital up front and, and more monthly recurring. It allows us to increase the margins and, and have a better, tighter relationship with those partners. Very great. So let's end it, Doug, with talking about the management team. So what makes uh, what gives us investors the confidence that you guys are the right team here for the job? I and mean, you have pretty cool history, you and Steve, and maybe go through that and end it there. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you look at our success, uh, you know, we, we've delivered on every commitment that we've made out there. We told uh, the investment community that we were going to uh, get to profitability. We did that. We told the investment community we were going to uplist to the NASDAQ organically. We did that. We told them we were going to do a raise. We did that. We told them we'd go do an acquisition. We did that. So we've been successful in all of those endeavors. And it's because we've got a great management team. I've been working with our CEO, Steve Mahalo, for 33 years now in the telecom industry, uh, 22 years at our previous company, Intertel. Steve grew that company from uh, you know, a one-man show to $500 million before selling it to Mitel for $750 million about uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And so, you know, tremendous opportunity in the space. You know, the, the team here is a, an extremely well-oiled uh, management team that uh, works extremely well together. Uh, we've got great tenure in the industry, probably some of the best tenure in the industry that uh, that you'll find in any telecom company. We know how to manage a business. We know how to grow a business. We know how to grow a business profitably. And Doug, where can more people um, find more information about you? Yep. Thanks, Maj. Uh, great. Uh, so obviously, uh, you can go to our website, uh, www.crescendo, and that's spelled C-R-E-X-E-N-D-O.com. Uh, we haven't merged the two sites together. So if you want to find out more about NetSapiens, it's www.netsapiens.com. That's N-E-T-S-A-P-I-E-N-S.com. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm always uh, readily available to answer any questions. Uh, D Gaylor, G-A-Y-L-O-R at crescendo.com. And uh, look forward to uh, further discussions down the road. Awesome, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, Doug, for being here. Look forward to uh, continue to be a shareholder and see how things progress in the future. Thanks, Maj. Greatly appreciate it. Take care. Yeah. All right. That's it for today's panel. Maj, thank you so much for uh, interviewing these two companies and to both the companies as well for participating. And uh, where can people go and find more information about you and subscribe to Geo Investing? Yeah. So thank you, Bobby. You can come to geoinvesting.com and learn more about what we do. Uh, you can either opt in to receive information about us on an ongoing basis, or you can join our premium services to just jump right into it. Um, and you can email me at maj at geoinvesting.com. Uh, we currently do offer a seven day free trial, but not for long. We're increasing prices soon, capping memberships. Sorry, Bobby, <laughs> but you're already in though. You're already in. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And, um, so just, yeah, just come on board and try us out. I think you'll really love what we're doing. I think, you know, this is just, Hey, just me, me talking. I'm not, not biased at all, but I think in terms of organic 
lead driven research sprinkled with, you know, handpicked contributor researchers. We're we probably, you know, we're, I think we're just, it's, we're unmatched. We're just working really hard every day, reading filings, reading conference call transcripts, interview management teams, it's, uh, 90% organic research from a, from a team that's been doing it for a long time now for like maybe 14 years now. And I've been a full-time investor for 30 years. So we'd love to have more people on board. Very good. Maj, you're the man. Really appreciate it, dude. Thank you, man. Thank you.